well, as you know, um, summer of last year uh, marked the centenary of the start of the first imperialist world war. And to coincide with that anniversary, there was a lot of propaganda in the imperialist countries as to what this war was about. So this imperialist propaganda um, divides into, there was really just a mistake. Nobody wanted the war. They just sleep, walked into the war. Um, when in fact, um, the two opposing sides, uh, Germany and her allies on one side, and Britain and her allies on the other side had been preparing for that war for good on to two dec decades. And this was a war about the redivision of the world. Because what happened at the Berlin Congress in 1884-85 was that it had carved up Africa between the various imperialist powers. And that was the last time that a peaceful division of the world was effected and was affected at that particular time because there were still, if you like, unoccupied territories there. Not unoccupied in the sense that there were no local people living there. It is that they had not been occupied by any of the imperialist powers. And so depending on the um, strength, economic and military strength of the powers, Africa was carved up. However, within two decades of that carve up, the strength of the imperialist parties underwent a dramatic change. Germany and her allies became much stronger uh, economically. Their um, rate of development was higher. They surpassed, if you like, um, Britain principally. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, Britain had relatively gone down. And as is the law of capitalism, each one wants their fair share. I say, well, Denny's got more slaves than I have. I would like an equal share. And Denny says, well, these are lawfully mine, right? But these law f were lawfully Denny's because they were settled at a time when Denny was much more powerful than we were. And, and, the, and, 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 and therefore, uh, they, w they wouldn't give up. There would have been no First World War. If Britain, for example, had been willing to say, yes, we've got too much, France had been willing to say, we got too much, and we're willing to give up a part of it. But that was not the case. And since they could not divide on that, they could, sorry, could not agree on that, this could only be de decided by use of force, and, and hence the First World War. But of course, the story is also put forward, at least in Britain and America, that Britain, but subsequently when America joined the war, which was more than two years into the war, they fought for liberal d democratic rights. Whereas Germany was fighting for autocracy, Germany was fighting for, uh, you know, uh, dictatorship. Germany was violating the rights of small nations. In fact, they were all violating the rights of small nations. And as the Bolsheviks had put forward the idea, the only way the war can be ended is by the proletariat of each of the belligerent countries in this inter-imperialist war saying, we shall not go along with this war, we shall use the war to overthrow our own ruling class, i.e. to turn the imperialist war into a civil war. The only people who turned that slogan into effect were the Bolsheviks. And really what finished the war and at the end, what brought it uh, to a halt, what put an end to it was A, the Russian Revolution of 1917, and B, there were revolutionary movements that could have succeeded had it not been for the treachery of social, social democracy in Germany, for example. In, 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 in Hungary, for example, and uh, several other places, the movement was, was squashed. But all the same, the German bourgeoisie got very frightened as to what was going to happen. So that's really what brought the war to an end. And the Russian Revolution and the coming to an end of the war was proof enough of the correctness of, of the Bolshevik position, that if you want to put an end to the war, then you must actually overthrow imperialism. And so the struggle against the war is a futile struggle unless it's linked with the struggle for the overthrow of imperialism. And the reason that imperialism was not overthrown uh, elsewhere apart from Russia is because of the treachery of social democracy and hence the importance of Lenin's slogan that the struggle for socialism 
and, and for the overthrow of imperialism is a sham and a humbug unless it's accompanied by the struggle against opportunism. So these are the two really important parts. Yeah, the introduction uh, that uh, I made to the uh, presentation, uh, to, to the meeting that was held by the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist-Leninist, on the subject of the First World War, war on the occasion of its 100th anniversary of its starting, was actually going into the background, his, the historical background that uh, of the years, of the century even, leading up to the war. Um, and, you know, how these disputes had been festering uh, for a long time and giving a few details of, of what those were. Um, and then secondly, something that had always mystified me, uh, that if it was a war over the, over the colonies, you know, well, why was it fought in these horrible muddy fields in Belgium and France? And, and so I found answers to those and I thought I'd uh, share them uh, in order to assist people to understand the whole process of the war. Um, and then also, uh, at the end of the book, uh, there is a speech made by Paul Cannon at uh, a Stalin Society in Birmingham in, uh, again, the same year, uh, 2014, uh, where he talks about the mutinies among the British troops uh, who were stationed in France. Uh, so there's a lot of description of the terrible way that the soldiers, the working class soldiers, were treated uh, by the officers and men. They were just expected to sacrifice their lives and think nothing of it, and, and no care really was taken to, to, to look after them. Um, and then they were subjected to horrible punishments, and uh, many of them just deserted. And uh, th there was a, a, an actual mutiny uh, which was kept extremely quiet. And so it, it was interesting to see that um, both in the French army and in the uh, British Army, the, you know, the soldiers themselves were beginning to be su subject to unrest, uh, and this was obviously particularly so following the Russian Revolution. Um, so, to that extent, you know, it feeds into this whole question of, of why the war uh, finally did come to an end. And that was etap. That was etap. Etap, yes. Thank you. Really useful. Thank you. But um, it's not the reason that's generally given or understood when people talk about the causes of World War I. People say, well, Archduke you know, Franz Ferdinand was assassinated, or it was about the right of self-determination of Belgium as a small country that was you know, suppressed by... Well, that's just not true, because there have been lots of assassinations of kings and queens before, and that does not lead to the war, because if a king or queen is assassinated, somebody else takes over. Uh, that's no reason to have a war, let alone a world, world war. Um, what happened was that the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand uh, of Austria was the pretext for the triggering of hostilities. But the hostilities were being prepared for for a very, very long, 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 long time. And the two sides had, uh, I mean, Germany had been preparing for that war for two decades. So had been Britain, you only have to look at their uh, the development of their armaments, their, their naval forces, um, their, 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 their armed forces. They, they, they've just been, been preparing for it. And nothing was really, if you like, a rude shock to them when the war, war broke out. It might have been a rude shock that uh, Russia would ally with France, right? But that, that always happens. Who will ally, ally with, 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 with whom? Or that the Tur Turkey would ally with, 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 with Germany. But that's not the point. The, the, the two primary powers in that war were Germany and Austria on one side and Britain and France on the, on, on the other. And they definitely had been preparing uh, for, uh, for, for, for war. So nothing to do with that. As far as right of self-determination, Belgium's right to self-determination is not the only right, only right. There are lots of other nations whose rights were being violated. They had actually concluded treaties for the suppression of small nations. And as soon as they came to power, the Bolsheviks published those treaties that this war was not for the liberation of small nations, but for the subjugation of small nations. Um, as you know, the whole of the um, Middle East was divided after the First World War. The Turkish Empire was broken up. And all the Turkish colonies principally went to Britain and France. And that's where... And that was the Sykes. 
Sykes-Picot agreement, and 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 so Britain got Palestine, Britain got present-day Iraq, uh, Syria and Lebanon went to uh, went to went to France, and so various various colonies were divided. It was also as a as a result of that that, uh, for example, the German colonies in southern Africa, southwest Africa, Namibia. Um, uh, uh, was was given to Britain uh, as as a mandated territory. They couldn't call them colonies in in those those period. They called them mandates for civilization. Uh, but they also said civilization wouldn't come for a thousand years, didn't they? And yeah. I wonder if, lastly, thank you very much. I wonder if, you, lastly, you just tell us a little bit about the different sections of the book and and just what's inside it. Can you? Um, but there are four sections um, to to the book. One is a um, inter. You know, we held. Um, to two, two meetings. Uh, one was uh, under the um, aegis of the uh, Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist-Leninist. At that meeting, there were three speeches made. First one was by Ella Rule, who chaired the meeting, and she gave an introduction. So the first um, part of it is her introduction. Then Deborah Fox, one of our members, made a presentation. Although, of course, she admitted that the war was for redevision of the world, her main thrust was to show that really Britain was very prepared and Britain wanted to go to war. The whole idea that Britain didn't know that it was going to go to, go to war is just uh, uh, to, to, total rubbish. So her idea was to actually um, to refute the assertions made by people like Michael Gove, the former education secretary, that Britain was fighting for liberal values and Britain didn't want the war, and the war just literally happened somehow. Um, there is an Australian professor called Clark, Christopher Clark, I think, I'm not sure, um, uh, who, who's written that you know, the various combatants simply sleepwalked into the, in, into the war. They didn't sleepwalk. They'd been so bloody awake for two decades preparing for that war that the question of sleepwalking didn't, 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 didn't arise. Uh, and, and so there was this massive industrial scale slaughter, the first type of industrial scale slaughter uh, that was witnessed during the First World War took place in order to decide which group of these tiny handful of countries, imperialist bandits, was to have what share of the world's loot, wealth, avenues for investment, uh, raw uh, access to raw materials, uh, and, 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 ma and markets, that, that's really uh, what the whole thing was about. So the sections of the book were... And, 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 and then I made a presentation that the First World War was an imperialist war to redivide the world. So my, my one deals with that one particularly. And then the fourth part is a speech given by Keith Bennett at Stalin Society, which is on the Easter Uprising of 1916, which does link the question of taking advantage of the war to have an uprising. And that's what the Easter Uprising was, whose leader undoubtedly was James, James, James Connolly. So it, it uh, really uh, has a lot of quotations from James Connolly, which are worth studying by communists and progressive people in this country and, 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 and elsewhere. And his whole idea is that, you know, why should the socialists of one country be sending projectiles to kill those comrades on the other side with whom they've been joining in hands working for peace before the First World, First World War. And, and they're not going to be pleased by the fact that the proje projectiles sent to kill them were sent by their former comrades. And he's got some really heart-wrenching quotations. I, I can't remember the details of it, but you, you need to re read them. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a good pamphlet it's something that puts our position forward. It's a Marxist-Leninist position, and it's a position that should, it's a thinking that should permeate the working class movement so that they, they're not deceived into having other wars. So you think that the imperialist war laid the basis for the imperialist peace that we've experienced ever since? There's a strong connection. Well, imperialist war will always lead to an imperialist peace, which in turn, in turn prepares the conditions for an imperialist war until such time as imperialism is overthrown. That's why the concentration of the progressive humanity of communists in the leadership has to be to overthrow imperialism. Unless you do that, uh, you know, as Lenin used to say, the, the, the fable of last war is just that. It's a fable. 
There will be no such thing as last war. There will be another war. I remember in my youth, when America was defeated in Vietnam, saying, they've learned the lesson, they'll never wage a war again. Well, no, they haven't learned any lesson. It's not a question of learning the lesson. It's the logic of imperialism. It has its own logic. It seeks domination. And in its, uh, you know, hankering after domination, it tramples over the independence of other nations. It tramples over the rights of humanity. And it wages war again and again. And it'll never, ever give up. That is in the very nature of imperialism. And it doesn't matter who the president of the United States is. At one time, we should say, if a black man became president, everything will be fine. Well, it's, it, it really is not. And now they'll be saying, if a woman became president, be nice. Well, let Hillary, Hillary Clinton <laughs> become, and, and then, 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 then you, will, you, will, you will find exactly the same. Because whoever becomes the president of the United States of America, under the conditions of imperialism, is the chief executive of American imperialism. It's Wall Street that rules. It's not an individual who lives in the White House. Nice life, though it may be for him but it, or her. It's, it's, it's not important who, who, is the, who is the president. Ignorance is venomous and it murders the soul Spreading like a virus, running red but out of control So if I should ever fall and get caught in a hustle Let them know that I died while I fought in a struggle From the hood rats to rich kids lost in a bubble Spray painted on the streets and in the subway tunnels Write it down and remember that we never gave in The mind of a child is where the revolution begins So if the solution has never been to look at yourself How is it that you expect to find it anywhere else?